up to this point in Romans chapter 4. We're going to begin at verse 18. The Apostle Paul had made it so clear that the whole salvation, and I, I, I stress that. Don't let that pass by you. My whole salvation and all of its blessings, all of its benefits, all of the inheritance of grace is totally, totally conditioned on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we have the assurance that he is able to fulfill in our stead all of those conditions because of who he is and what he accomplished on Calvary. Well, who is Jesus Christ? Well, he is God in human flesh without sin. He is God-man. And I always quote Matthew chapter 1, you know, where the angel appeared unto Joseph and said that Mary is going to have a son and you're going to call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Well, how in the world could we believe that one who is born of woman would be able to do such a task? to save sinners, a multitude of sinners, sinners whom God gave him before the foundation of the world. The Bible says, how in the world could we have any confidence that such a, such a person could save me, could save you, could save any of us? Well, then in Matthew 1, he makes it clear, his name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. He's God. The Bible is the revelation. The gospel is the revelation of the righteousness of God. Now that's how we're assured that he's able because the righteousness in which we stand before God is not the righteousness of a mere man. For man has no righteousness. The Bible says there was a time that man did have righteousness. That was in Adam before the fall. But what happened? He lost it. So what do I need? I need a righteousness I can't lose. A righteousness that can't be contaminated. So the gospel is the revelation of the righteousness of God. Well, how is it the righteousness of God? Well, it's the righteousness that God sent his son into the world to uh, accomplish. It's the righteousness that the God-man, God in human flesh, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished on my behalf, you see. So that's what Paul had been telling that Abraham, as, as highly esteemed as Abraham was in the view of the, of the unbelieving Jews, they needed to understand, look, Abraham was nothing more than a sinner saved by grace based on the righteousness of another, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you consider, you know, you think about that. When you consider that uh, the, the apostles in the early days of the, of the church, that they were going around telling the unbelieving Jews that Abraham, whom you claim to be your father, he was, he was justified before God. That means he was forgiven by God. He was pardoned. He was declared righteous by God based upon the righteousness of the one whom we crucified. <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth. And you, you all have said nothing good can come out of Nazareth. But one did. And that was Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. So that's what he's saying here. And then in verse 18 here, when he talks about hope, verse 18, who against hope? Now he's talking about Abraham there. Abraham against hope believed in hope. Now what did he believe? Well, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken. Now, in other words, because it was based upon something that was spoken. Now, who spoke it? God did. This is God's word. All right. This is not like the word of faith movement. You ever heard of that? The word of faith? They said, well, if you speak a word, it's going to come true. That's bull. <laughs> this is God's word. See? So according to that which was spoken... And then, then he, he quotes from Genesis, so shall thy seed be. What is that? Genesis, what, 15? In other words, where God told Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. Well, what, Ab what, what the apostle Paul is, is saying here by inspiration of the Spirit is that God is the God of hope. 
But what is hope? Well, hope is the certain assurance of the fulfillment of an expectation. That's what hope is. Now, don't think of hope as wishing, you know, and that, this is where words mean things. Don't think of hope as wishful thinking. You know, a lot of times, you know, yesterday, uh, uh, about uh, five minutes till seven, I thought probably made a statement like this. I hope Kentucky beats Texas A&M. But it certainly wasn't a certain expectation of a, of a fulfilled desire. And, of course, you know how that hope come out, all right? Those coaches blew it. All right, no. <laughs> but don't think of hope that way. Wishful thinking. My, my old pastor used to say, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, you know. It's kind of like Dorothy clicking her heels together. You know, there's no place like home. There's no, you know. That's not hope in the Bible. The hope of the gospel is a certain assurance of an expected desire that's based upon something that is solid. And what is the something that is solid here? The word of God. God's word. And here's what we know about God. Number one, he's faithful to his word. He's never unfaithful. That's what the, in Romans 3 when it talks about let God be true and every man a liar. That doesn't mean that everybody lies all the time. Now, you know, when it comes to salvation, by nature we lie because we don't know any better. But when it says let God be true and every man a liar, what he's talking about is that God is always faithful to his promise. He's never unfaithful. Lamentations chapter 3, when it says it's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. And then it says, great is thy faithfulness. So, and we sing a hymn, great is thy faithfulness. So God's always faithful. But secondly, God is powerful enough and wise enough to foresee and overcome every obstacle that would hinder him making good on his promise or which would, which uh, 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 he's also uh, powerful enough and wise enough to provide every means necessary to bring about his promise. So he's the God of hope. Well, what is the hope of the gospel? Now, there's where we need to go. Well, it's related here to what Abraham was told, so shall thy seed be. Now, we know, look at verse 19. He says, and being not weak in the faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, you know the story of Abraham and Sarah. Sarah. Abraham married Sarah. Sarah was barren. She could not have children. And God had promised Abraham and Sarah that they would have a child. They would have a seed. That was a posterity. Time went on, and nothing happened. They couldn't have children. And we'll look at some of the other issues of that in a moment. But... It was nigh on when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was right behind him that God told him, now I've told you, you're going to have a seed. And, and you know, at 100 years old, 99 years old, you're going to... So what, what he's saying here is that Abraham, in order to believe that promise, he had to look past physical circumstances. He had to look past human logic and reasoning which told him that they weren't ever going to have a child. But God said, so shall thy seed be. And then we know that Abraham was the father of two nations. We know he's the father of the Jewish nation, and he's the father of the Arab nation too. Through his son, through Isaac and Ishmael and all that. Now, we're going to, I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Abraham had times of unbelief. All right, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But what he's saying here is that the only, the only foundation of hope that Abraham had of the fulfillment of that promise was just the word of God. It wasn't anything else. He, uh, he believed it now, but he had, he had times of unbelief. His wife had times of unbelief. And they knew that whatever, if this was going to be fulfilled in them physically, that they didn't have the the power, they didn't have the, 
the uh, ability to do it. Only God is able. Now what you have there is a perfect picture of salvation by the grace of God. That's what it is. Because by nature, we are all, we all fell in Adam into sin and death. And by nature, we are born spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. That means that we're spiritually ignorant and we have no spiritual desires to that which glorifies God. I didn't say we have no religious desires. Man by nature is religious. Think about Cain. He was a religious man. But he was spiritually dead. He didn't want to come God's way. Robert, we were talking earlier about somebody said you've got to accept the gift. See, what if you're going to, all right, let's take that, that illustration. You know, as people say, well, you've got to accept it. You've got to accept the free gift. Well, you do. But if you want to go, if you want to think biblically, here's what you would have to say. It's a gift that none of us want by nature and will not receive until God changes our will. And that's why we have to be born again. Or we won't see or enter the kingdom of God. We don't have any desire for it. So that's our state. We are as spiritually dead as Sarah's womb was physically. And if there's going to be salvation, it's got to come by the word and the power and the faithfulness of God. And what is the hope of the gospel? It's the hope of salvation conditioned on Christ, based on his blood and righteousness alone. And those who come any other way, they don't have the right promise. You know, a preacher who tells you, God promises to save you if you'll do this or if you'll do that. Well, that's not the hope of the gospel. God never promised to save anybody that way. He didn't say, Abraham, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a child if you'll do certain things for me. Or if you'll just accept the free gift even. He didn't say that. He got Abraham, jerked him out of Ur of the Chaldees by, by convincing him, giving him spiritual life. And, convince, and he said, now you're going to have a child. And that's it. Now, the promise that God gave Abraham was more than just physical, though, wasn't it? And in fact, the, the main issue that Paul has in mind here in Romans 4 is not just the birth of two nations, the Jews and the Arabs, at all. In fact, he's specifically speaking of Isaac. Isaac. Because Ishmael was born of the bondwoman, Hagar. You remember? And that was not what God promised. And you know, Abraham argued that Ishmael would be his heir, but he wasn't. God told him, he said, no, this ain't going to be. You know, Abraham argued even before that that he had a servant, Eleazar, who was going to be his heir. And God said, no, that's not going to be your heir. You're going to have a son. And you remember one time when, they, when God uh, repeated the promise to him, Sarah overheard it, and you remember what she did? She laughed because she was too old. So the main thrust here is Isaac. And what is it about Isaac? He's the child of promise. And through Isaac was going to come who? Christ, according to the flesh, who was born of the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, according to the flesh. And that's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He's the one upon whom all of salvation is conditioned. So the promise to which God is really referring to here through Paul is Abraham becoming the spiritual father of all who are brought to believe in Christ, to submit to his righteousness. Uh, I've got referenced in your lesson, Galatians 3, 26 through 29, where it talks about who are the children of Abraham. In other words, that is the children of faith. What's well, all who believe, Jew and Gentile? So verse, read verse 19 again. Being not weak in faith. Now there were times that Abraham was weak in faith. I'm going to show you. This is not talking about any perfection in Abraham. But his tenor of life was that Abraham was a man of faith. Now if you're a believer, if you're a real Christian, <laughs> made so by the grace of God, you're a person of faith. But you still have times of unbelief, don't you? I know I do. Maybe you're all better than me. I don't know. No, I know what. You, 
I know what you go through. And so you have those times, and you have to fight it. That's, part of the, that's one of the main battlegrounds of the warfare of the flesh and the spirit, isn't it? You know, it were like that fellow who had a sick child, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. That's the way I've been. And so he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, uh, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. And then look at verse 20. It says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now, the point here is not to boast of any perfection in Abraham himself or any even perfect faith that Abraham had because Abraham was a sinner saved by grace. Abraham, what's, Paul, what's his whole point here? Abraham's righteousness before God was not anything that Abraham worked out or willed for himself. It was Christ and him alone. That's the whole point of Romans 4, isn't it? That Abraham was justified before God based upon Christ's righteousness imputed to him. Nothing else. And if it had been conditioned on Abraham, Abraham would have been a failure, just like all of us. So when it says he staggered not at the promise of God but was, uh, through unbelief, but was strong in faith, it's not talking about that Abraham was a perfect man. If you read the book of Genesis... In the biography of Abraham that's recorded there, you'll see Abraham had his problems. He had his inward struggles. You remember he, uh, he knew, he believed, it's recorded that even though God promised Abraham Sarah and Sarah that they, he would provide for them a son, Abraham argued that his servant Eleazar was going to be his heir because he, he kind of lost sight of things. Remember he, he lied to Pharaoh and Abimelech about his wife, Sarah, because he was afraid that they would kill him to have her. Now, now you've got to remember in the context, see, God promised Abraham and Sarah they would have a son. Abraham went through that. And, of course, you know the episode in Genesis 16 where Sarah uh, brought the handmaid Hagar to Abraham and said, well, God promised us a son. We haven't had one. Maybe it's going to be through this woman. And so there, out of that came Ishmael. And then you go on and go on. So it's not talking about when it says he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong. What it's talking about is the tenor of Abraham's life there. He was a man of faith. But still a sinner saved by grace. But isn't that, if you're saved, isn't that what you are? Isn't that what I am? I believe and that's the tenor of my life. But I've had my moments, and you have too. I and mean, you'll have more if the Lord lets us live on this earth much longer. But here's the key to what he's talking about in verse 20. Faith gives glory to God. Now, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you this. Our faith is not in us. It's not in our abilities. It's not in our goodness. It's not in our determinations. It's not in our wills. Faith is not even in our faith. Did you know that? You know what most people have? They have faith in their faith. They think they've made the difference between heaven and hell, between lost and saved. No, faith gives glory to God. And what does that mean? That means to believe that Christ is your whole salvation, that he fulfilled all the conditions that he met all the conditions, that he is your only righteousness before God, that glorifies every attribute of God's character and nature. Well, how do you know it glorifies every attribute? Because the Bible says, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Bible says that God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Christ is the summation. Christ and the righteousness that he established that ensures and demands the eternal salvation and final glory of all for whom he lived, died, was buried, and rose again is the glory of God. How God can be just and justifier. That God justifies the ungodly and does it in a way that is not dishonoring to himself. Based on Christ's righteousness imputed. His blood and righteousness alone. 
That's the glory of God. That's the Shekinah. You ever heard that term, the Shekinah? Got a little pamphlet back there called uh, uh, The Glory of God in the Gospel, and it talks about that. The Shekinah was a word that the old ra rabbis used to talk about the dwelling place of God, where God revealed himself in the fullest, in the highest. And back in the Old Covenant, in the Old uh, Testament period uh, of the Old Covenant law, you remember the Shekinah dwelt above the mercy seat because that's where God revealed the highest glory of himself. And, of course, that mercy seat was a picture of Christ, wasn't it? And you remember when at the birth of Christ the angel came to the shepherds and what did the, the angel say? Glory to God in the highest. That's not saying glory to God up there somewhere. That means in this child who is God in human flesh, the child uh, born, the son given, Emmanuel, is the highest manifestation of God's glory that can ever be found. And that's in Christ. Now, to believe his promise of salvation conditioned on Christ based on his righteousness alone, that gives glory to God. To disbelieve that promise and try to come some other way, that dishonors every attribute of God. That's how serious this is. Well, Abraham believed God. And then look at verse 21. He says, and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, God was able to perform. Here's, here's some things I know. I know I am not able. <laughs> there are times I'm not even able to stand up here and preach to you. I, I'm serious. But I know God is able. God is able. I love that passage in 2 Timothy, uh, what is it, one twelve, Where Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded. That's what he says here. Abraham was fully persuaded. Now, who persuaded him? Was it some golden-throated preacher? <laughs> no. It's the Holy Spirit. Christ, through the Holy Spirit, persuades us that God is able. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. He's not only able to save me, he's able to keep me, to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And what have I committed unto him? My whole salvation. You see, I don't believe that he did his part, and now I've done my part. I don't believe that. I believe he did it all. All righteousness is in him. And I know I'm not able. <laughs> I find that out in so many ways and so many times. And so he goes back to the theme. Look at verse 22. And therefore, for this reason, it, there's that word it again that appears in Romans 4 so many times. It was imputed to him. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, what is it there? Well, it's the same one back here in, in uh, verse 3. Look at verse 3. For what saith the scripture? What did God say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Well, what is the it? That's a pronoun, isn't it? Got to have an antecedent. Got to refer to something. Well, what was imputed to Abraham for righteousness? Well, read verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. The it there is the righteousness of Christ according to God's promise. Now, scholars will tell you this, so-called scholars. They'd say, well, that it can't be righteousness because Paul wouldn't repeat himself. Are you kidding me? The Bible is full of repetition. In fact, let me just put it to you this way. You know, you know the, the message of the book of Exodus? You know it's the same message as the book of Genesis? You know the message of Leviticus? 
Same message as Genesis and Exodus. Deuteronomy, same. same. You can go all the way through. It's the same. You know the message of Revelation? Same basic message as Genesis. It's all salvation by God's grace through the blood and the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you want to read it technically, all right, here's how you would read it. Look at verse 3, for example. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and what God promised to Abraham was counted to him for righteousness. You could read it that way. Now, ask yourself this question. What did God promise Abraham? Salvation based on the righteousness of another. That's what he promised. him. And that other, that person, whose righteousness was imputed to Abraham, was going to come through Abraham and Sarah according to the flesh by the child of promise. And that was their whole salvation. So in verse 22, therefore it, what God promised Abraham, he believed that God was able to fulfill that. Whatever it was that God promised Abraham, well, that was imputed to him. That's what he's saying, for righteousness. Now again, what did God promise Abraham? Christ and his righteousness. That's what God promised him. And that was imputed to him for righteousness. It wasn't faith that was imputed to him. Faith is not the merit of a work. Faith is a moral quality of care. And Abraham's faith was imperfect. Let me tell you something. Uh, whatever ground, uh, upon whatever ground God declares me justified, it's got to be perfect. It's got to be the perfection of righteousness. And I can tell you right now that I do have faith, God-given faith, but my faith is not yet the perfection of righteousness. But the one in whom my faith is, he's the perfection of righteousness. The perfection of righteousness can only be found in Christ. That's who God promised Abraham. And Christ himself said that, didn't he? He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. Okay.